Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. At this time, please turn off all electronic devices. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kellyanne Conway. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Highbush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. In honor of our men and women in uniform and our first responders around the world who protect and defend our freedoms, if you please stand and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Before we get started, there are a few people in the audience that I'd like to make sure I recognize, and I will start with one of our very special trustees, a member of our board, and the best California governor, along with Ronald Reagan, but Pete Wilson, <laughs> Governor Wilson. <laughs> of course, former Congressman Elton Gallagher and his wife, Janice. Elton. Shannon Grove, State Senator of California. Shannon, I know you're here somewhere. <laughs> the founder of the Friends of Ronald Reagan, Mr. John Barger. John, there you are. <laughs> this last one of personal importance to me, I thought I'd point him out. This Doctor is one of three doctors that helped save my life, literally. Dr. Jeff Glazer. Jeff. <laughs> we are really thrilled to welcome Kellyanne Conway tonight. It is a special occasion, I know, for all of us, and not just because she's here with her really successful book. It's also her first time speaking at the Reagan Library. Yeah. But to be fair, I know there are a few other important firsts in her biography worth noting. She is the first woman to serve as a campaign manager for any Republican presidential nominee. This next one tops it. She's also the first woman to serve as the manager of a winning presidential campaign. <laughs> now, as an aside, for those keeping score, the second woman to manage a winning presidential campaign, her name was Jen O'Malley who managed President Biden's presidential campaign, but that one does not count because it was a campaign that never left a basement. So I'll just <laughs> Kellyanne obviously has a remarkably successful history 
in Republican politics as a political consultant, as a pollster, as a commentator, and as a spokesperson. Her firm has conducted opinion research for many of the best known office holders in the United States and best known global brands. But it's in the past five to six years that she has become a household name for her campaign work and then as senior counselor to President Trump during his first term in office. I imagine... <laughs> I imagine there are very few people in this room who have not seen her on camera outwitting an interviewer, holding the media accountable, or defending the policies of the Trump administration. In her memoir, she explains how she does it. And importantly, to quote Kellyanne, quote, how to survive and succeed in a male-dominated industry. But Kellyanne also gets personal in her book, and oftentimes vulnerable too, going well past what all of us see through the lens of a camera, sharing her personal highs and lows, and how she responded when the ugliness of social media hits home, or when political differences in one's own family plays out right on the front page. Though she makes it look easy, sparring with the media successfully is no mean feat. And being honest in public about personal and family struggles is, I am sure, even more difficult. Her book, Here's the Deal, not only opens the door into her personal life, but pulls back the curtain on what it's like to be a public figure. At the end of the day, even the most polished political prose are merely human. It's a lesson for all of us. Thank you, Kellyanne, for sharing your time, your story with us this evening, and through this marvelous book. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a conversation with Senior Counselor to the President, Kellyanne Conway. Incredible. This will be fun. Um, Kellyanne, thank you for coming. I truly mean that. Um, I said yes right away. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? I know you hear this often, but it's very humbling and such an honor to be here. And we'll talk a little bit more about my encounters with President Reagan as a young teenage girl. But I'd like to just take a moment to thank you, John, and everyone who is involved with the Reagan Library and everyone who is on the front lines fighting for freedom every single day. Thank you so much for making it a pleasure. I read every page of your book. I, I really loved it. Um, now, I, I might have been asleep for one little part, but I don't think so. And that is <laughs> when you explain the title, because I know, President Trump, prior to his presidency, wrote this famous book, The Art of the Deal. And I wondered if there was any kind of connection whatsoever between that and the title of your book, Here's the Deal. Sure. Well, first of all, let's move the water, because you were nice enough to play Let's Go Branding <laughs> and have the book right here, John, thank you for that. So the title was the most, one of the most difficult parts of the entire book. It took us a very long time to come up with one that was suitable and rated G based on <laughs> all the different things that are expressed in the book. Uh, but I also wanted it to be unimportant. I wanted people just to type in Kellyanne's book and come up with a book. And that's why my name appears very large, Conway's Little. And then the Here's the Deal is underneath. I think it is a play on words for Art of the Deal. And it's also everybody was speaking for me. There I was speaking for the country, speaking for the president, speaking for the executive office of the presidency, trying to get it right every single day. 
trying to communicate with people who, but for us communicating with them and to them, would not have access to that information, would not have access to those facts and figures, might not be able to understand why different decisions were being made and considerations were, and conversations were being had. And so then all of a sudden people were speaking for me. People I've never met think they know me, have a right to judge me or critique me or say what I'm really feeling, what's really going on. So this is just my way of saying, here's the deal. 500 pages, it's either, as I said to President Trump, it's either a showstopper or a doorstopper. You can decide. <laughs> I'll let you decide. Uh, but look, I go through, it is very humbling, you're right, but I go through not just the arc of my career, but the fact that because this is the greatest country that ever God, put, God ever put on the earth, this could be anybody's story because this is America. And America, if you work hard and you have values and you're loved and supported by people who feel that way about you unconditionally your entire life and you get a little lucky along the way, you're resilient, there's really nothing that you can't do. And so my experiences are unique to me, but in so many ways, they are just one little girl's version of the American dream, mm. and it's everyone's story. But look, it's not all, and it's also directional for politics. You know, John, I feel that for some people in this country right now, they look at the calendar every single day, and it says January 6th, every single day. And they want 74 million plus Trump-Pence voters to be in that U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. And that's not fair, and that's not true. So I'm very directional and very open and honest about what is it they want? How did the pollsters and the pundits and the media keep missing and keep undercounting and underrepresenting the sheer strength of the Trump-Pence voter, of the number of people who wanted to come to the polls who had never voted Republican or hadn't in a long time or maybe never even voted before? And they came and they wanted something different and something fresh and different. And so we talk about that and what does it mean for the future as well? Okay. Um, my questions, I, for the, I divided it into three sections. Oh, dear. Mm -hmm. In the first section... You know, John, I'm like the one Trump official who's <laughs> investigation-free, indictment-free, scandal-free, <laughs> subpoena-free. <laughs> so uh, is this the deposition? That they've been waiting to have me under? <laughs> All right, I want you to read the title of this section for me. In the beginning. In the beginning. Oh, wow, okay. it's going to be a long night. You mentioned <laughs> <laughs> Ronald Reagan. Uh, my, I, I read the book. Tell us the story about the first time you met Ronald Reagan. Not unlike millions and millions, tens of millions of Americans, I was inspired to go into politics by President Ronald Reagan. I was bitten and smitten at the age mm -hmm. of 17 because Ronald Reagan came to Hamilton, New Jersey, known as the blueberry capital of the world. It's the town in which my mother was born and grew up, and it's the town in which I went to the same school, St. Joe's School, for 13 years, from kindergarten to 12th grade. And there I was as a senior, co-captain of the field hockey team, had been a New Jersey blueberry princess, and Ronald Reagan is coming to Hamilton. <laughs> I don't know that the competition was that stiff, but that was... <laughs> That was what the sash said. But John, this was at a time when Republican presidential candidates were competitive in New Jersey. And of course, that year, less than, what, six, seven weeks later, President Reagan would go on to win 49 states, everything except the District of Columbia, Minnesota, including New Jersey. So he came to Hamilton, New Jersey, and the schools were closed, and I got to meet him. It was very, very brief behind the stage, I'm sure, for the first time in my life or ever, I was speechless. <laughs> and, but it was very brief, but I was really smitten. But I, it had started a couple months earlier when the local newspaper asked me to cover the two national political conventions. And to cover a convention in 1984 meant turn on your Magnavox TV and watch it. Mm -hmm. And so I did. But I was really excited, John, that Geraldine Ferraro mm -hmm. was the Democratic nominee for vice president because here is a woman from, Congresswoman from Queens, Italian Catholic, on a major party ticket. That was pretty remarkable because I had been raised by four strong Italian Catholic women in the house. Um, South Jersey's version of the Golden Girls, as I call them in the book, <laughs> and my other aunt who didn't live there. And so these four Catholic Italian women raised me, 
I met my father later on when I was 12. We never had a single political conversation I can recall. And that's mm. very common in America, where you get to your political ideals and ideas not through political conversations, but through other conversations. You know, we knelt for the Lord and we stood for the flag and we never confused the two. My family was filled with small business owners, veterans, active military, military spouses. Um, certainly, I should have been a Democrat and a feminist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I may have even been heading that way before I met President Reagan and really started to study politics. And there, and why would that be? Well, you know, I was raised with a house of all women. I'm half, I'm half Italian, half Irish, Catholic. Those were core constituencies of the Democratic Party for a very long time, changing now for a very long time. The men in my life, my cousins, my uncles, extended family, most of them were members of the private trades. They were in unions, union households in South Jersey and Philadelphia. Again, a core constituency of the Democratic Party. And my mother, a friend of hers, had given her Ms. Magazine when it came out. This is the era of no-fault divorce, of feminism, of Roe versus Wade. But there I was at 17 watching these two Republican and Democratic National Conventions. And I listened and I thought the Democratic Convention was okay. I thought she was fine. God rest her soul. I met her years later. She's a very nice person. But then I watched the Republican National Convention the next week. And there was President Ronald Reagan delivering his acceptance speech in Dallas. And here's a man with, with, with whom I had very little in common, it would seem. He's a different gender from a different coast. Really about four times my age. <laughs> old enough to be my grandfather. And yet... I felt that connective tissue, but so did millions of Americans. So there again, my story is my story, but it's a common story for so many people who felt that the inspirational, uplifting, morning in America, optimistic, America first, frankly, <laughs> uh, President Reagan ran and governed that way. National security, economic security, hopefulness for the future, and not backing down when it comes to America interest Americans and America herself. And yet he also, President Reagan also was delivering in a way that was somewhat self-deprecating and humorous, but at times very somber and serious when it needed to be as well. And he ended up being the lead of my story. Mm -hmm. And then I got to meet him seven weeks later and I was smitten and bitten by the political bug and I haven't been able to shake it since. Mm -hmm. um, I was not old enough to vote for President Reagan. I missed it by about two months and 10 days. Um, but I certainly just have admired him from afar and his presidency. And of course, then I took a job for $8 an hour with a gentleman named Richard Worthlin, who lived in California for a while. His client, his friend or client uh, wanted to run for governor of California and then ran for president of the United States. And Richard, Richard Worthlin was Ronald Reagan's pollster. And I was lucky to take a job in the summer of 1988, the end of the Reagan years, the beginning of what would be the George Herbert Walker Bush years. And I worked for the Worthland Group for $8 an hour, lowest person on the totem pole. And I learned so much, learned at the knees of the master, the craft, learned about messaging, learned about the importance to have a touchstone to the public's opinion, impressions, frustrations, fears, aspirations, and projections. And I have loved that career for the 34 years since. I took a little diversion. I was a lawyer. Uh, very briefly, I have a law degree, which really helped me in Washington, D.C., which unlike L.A. or Chicago or Boston or Miami or San Francisco, D.C. reveres bald heads and gray heads, and I didn't have either at the time. Mm -hmm. So I loved being 25 years old with a law degree admitted to practice in four states. I felt like it was an objective credential and a criterion where people would take me a little bit more seriously, and it also taught me to be logical, A, B, C, D, problem, solution. It really helped me be a... a, a decent businesswoman, and I learned early on, maybe the hard way, but I did learn that there's plenty of room for passion in business, but there's very little room for emotion, <laughs> and there's very there's a big difference between passion and emotion. My law degree helped that. My training as a pollster helped me do that, but I'm a fully recovered attorney, 12-step program and everything, <laughs> <laughs> have been for decades, <laughs> um, and, and I say that to you because I just could not get away from polling. I loved it so much. The gift, as I say in my book, John, the gift of my career early on was literally going to every single state in this country. Every single state. I've been to every single one doing projects. 
And when you sit across people and you talk to them for two hours and they lay it all out for you, and you look down and you're thinking, wow, this woman goes home, she's got three kids, she just said she's helping her elderly parents along, she works part-time, her husband works full-time, two jobs. She came up, she just, she just put it better than any elected official or candidate I had ever heard in that cycle because she's thought about this because it's important to her that these decisions be made wisely. And I learned to just love this amazing country and its beautiful people in a way that I could never and would never want to shake. There is such essential goodness and essential wisdom in people. And those sometimes who represent them, who are in Washington just a little too long, and repre <laughs> stop representing them because they don't really listen to the people anymore. They listen to the lobbies, they listen to the special interests, they listen to each other. They listen to themselves looking in the mirror, picturing the next senator or president. Mm -hmm. So listening to people really is very humbling and it's very gratifying and it is immensely rewarding but also revealing. And some of the best ads I've ever seen run, some of the best insights I've ever heard been dropped into speeches came directly from the people. And so I still love to do that and I think it helped tremendously to have had that background when Mr. Trump tapped me to be campaign manager in 2016. Yeah, now television in particular played a hugely important role in your rise. And, uh, it helped him too, you know. <laughs> it did. But, but talk to us, you, you mentioned in your book about this, the consultants club and the, these guys that are, you know, they might be hyper good analysts, but they're, they're fearful of the television camera and you were not, and that is what really sprung you into terrific clients, and tell us that story. It did help, so I started to go on TV in the mid-90s when very few people did, and I remember the late, great um, Roger Ailes had me audition for Fox News Channel. He did invite me to have a contract, and I said no, and very few people have ever said no to Roger Ailes. <laughs> uh, the only reason I said no was simple. I was involved in a presidential, I was going to be involved in a presidential campaign that cycle and I felt I had to keep myself open to be able to go on the TV, just be able to play the field on the TV for the candidates, for the clients. But obviously I've been on Fox News thousands of times since mm -hmm. and, and really admire the, the Fox News channel that Roger built and that Suzanne Scott has taken over since and done a great job. But CNN, boy are they going to be <laughs> angry about this, CNN, that's the network that put me on the map. They offered me a paying gig in January of 1996 for the entire 1996 presidential cycle. And uh, two of the executives at CNN invited me and a woman named Farai Judea. She had recently graduated from Harvard University and she, Harvard College, and I believe she was on NPR. And they hired, you would never see this now on a Chiron, but I literally was the CNN Generation X mm. conservative political analyst. And she literally was the Generation X liberal um, political analyst. You would never see that now. I mean, the anchors won't even call themselves liberals and should. Mm -hmm. uh, truth in advertising. But CNN, it put me on the map. And what happened for me in my career was transformative in this way. That people who were trying to get in my way or even be complimentary. Oh, we like Kellyanne, but she's new. <laughs> oh, you know, crinkle the nose. She's good and there's always a but but she doesn't work as hard as I, we've been doing this for a while. And they really have, but they were all, after a while in the consultancy, what I fondly refer to as staff infection. Um, <laughs> just been around a long time, there's a certain sclerosis that takes hold when you have no incentive to do better, to be better, to build a better mousetrap, to get out there, get off your duff in Alexandria, Virginia, and Manhattan, New York, and go listen to the rest of the country. And Washington DC and New York City are not exactly swing states. And uh, so I did it with great affection, but what happened was people could, could no longer undercut me or people could no longer doubt. And actually people could no longer say, I sort of kind of know who that is, but I really don't know her because what happened is candidates, senators, members of Congress, captains of industry, someone's cousin's brother's friend who was the new director of marketing at a Fortune 500 company would say, I saw her on TV. Hmm. She made a lot of sense, or I hadn't thought about things that way. That was really cool. Or how does she come up with all those analogies to be witched in the Brady Bunch, in which case I was dating myself. Um, 
calm down, everybody, not dating myself. Dating myself, excuse me. My <laughs> and it helped tremendously, but it also helped me to get feedback. There wasn't social media then. There wasn't, we, I think there was C-SPAN and a couple of the cable stations, so people would hand write notes and give me criticism. They would observe quite correctly that I had a bad hair day, bad hair life. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the comments I got were substantive, and to this moment, people will say, thank you for saying X or Y. I didn't know that or had a thought about that, or how come more people don't talk about that? Mm -hmm. And in that, in that way, frankly, I think that Reagan in 80, Newt Gingrich in 94, Donald Trump in 2016, all led these different revolutions that had a couple things in common. One, that transformative, once in a generation leader, that number two, can cut out the middleman a little bit and take the message directly to the people and have it be very specific and very accessible and credible and compelling, persuasive and memorable. And then thirdly, to, to bring people along who either say, used to say, I hate politics, or I don't want to vote Republican, I don't like Republicans, I don't even know any Republicans, or my vote doesn't count, why should I even bother? And I feel in every case, especially with President Trump, just given the advent of social media and the way he used it, I say, John, it was really the democratization of information. And what I mean is cutting out the middleman, making sure that everyone had instant free of charge access to a presidential communication. And I was just a staffer, just a staffer, just a pollster. So to try to do that as just one small molecule, pushing that boulder up the hill every single day has been a remarkable privilege because the audience for me is never the anchor Sorry, it's never been the anchor. They say, how do you go up against so-and-so? How do you go? I don't know, because they're not really the audience. I answer their questions. Even when they say, you're not answering the question, I say, but I am answering the question. I've answered it 12 times now, and it's still not a good question, but I answered it all 12 times. <laughs> um, the audience is always the people. The audience is always the people, and great leaders figure out a way to connect with folks in a fashion that makes them feel like they are included. You're not just a part of a political campaign, you're a member of a movement. And of course, we are on hallowed ground here at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley. I had the enormous privilege to be on hallowed ground earlier with some of you in the living quarters of President and Mrs. Reagan. And he was known as a great communicator for a reason. But guess what, John, he had to communicate something that you believed, that you needed, you were thirsting for, that you understood, that you wanted, that you agreed with. So great communicators can only be great communicators if they've got the policy prescriptions to back them up and if they have one other thing, joy on the job. <laughs> there are so many people now in public life, so many people on social media just hunkered over like a gargoyle, angry <laughs> all day long, <laughs> poison keyboard. It doesn't look like fun to me. It's got everybody so miserable. But Ronald Reagan, joy on the job, and people watching say, oh, Donald Trump didn't have joy on the job. Yes, he did. With the exception of 1972 and the exception of 2020, which is just an odd campaign given what you said. But with the exception of 1972, from 1960 to 2016, voters in this country at the presidential level opted for the candidate that they thought was more forward-looking, optimistic, just cheerful, positive. And in 1972, President Nixon had other attributes going from, frankly, he got more than 60% of the vote among men and women. Nobody has done that since. It's unheard of now. But we go for the people. You know, it's George W. Bush <laughs> against Gore and Kerry. Frankly, it's President, it's Barack Obama, Senator Obama against um, McCain and Romney. And it's Trump over Hillary. People don't want to turn on the TV or access a politician who's just talking about all the problems. We already know the problems, what are your solutions? And they want people who are gonna show up and speak up and stand up. And then they want to follow them. So on the TV, I always looked at myself as a tiny little staff level microcosm of all of that. Because there are people out there, many people, most people, they can't pay to go to some political fundraiser and be able to talk to their senator or congressman or governor or candidates. They don't know someone and know someone and know someone to get the answers. 
they're relying on us to get it right, to tell them what they need to know. And that was a privilege. I, as you know, in the beginning chapters of the book, I said no to press secretary and comms director, like right off the bat, President Trump offered it to me, President-elect Trump offered it to me, said, you'd be a great press secretary. And I'm thinking to myself, I'd be an absolutely terrible press secretary. Hmm. I'm not even sure what they do. And I still kind of, I still kind of wonder, I certainly wonder these days. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> But the TV is different. I'm much more shy than I am on TV in, per, in, in real life, in person. I'm much more the little girl in South Jersey who, only child, raised by a single mom, who was, I was lining up all of my dolls and my stuffed animals as my judge, jury, prosecutor, and witnesses. <laughs> I never lost a single case in my little bedroom <laughs> growing up. And I'm just a grown-up version of all that. And you, um, tell us, I, you, there's a great story in the book about when Donald Trump, not yet president, asked you to become his campaign manager. And I want to know, were you genuinely surprised at the moment? And had he planned that out the way he was going to ask you, or was it a spur of the moment? You know what? She'd be a great campaign manager. How did that go? I was very surprised. I certainly had prepared and worked super hard, as so many have for that moment, but never thought I would have that moment in the Republican Party that tends to, you know, candidates often lose, but the consultants always win. So the candidates lose, and the consultants go to the next precious prey and say, you need to hire me. Mm. I was involved in the last losing presidential <laughs> campaign. Um, and, but, you know, politicians are perfect for that because they'll say, you know what, if you listen to me, <laughs> yeah. the other guy didn't listen to me. He was too stiff, seemed too old, seemed too angry. <laughs> if you listen to me, you'll win. But I think President Trump wanted something different because he was something different. And not unlike, again, President Reagan, people wanted to go outside of the political system. Of course, President Reagan had been a two-term governor of California, but he lost his first race for president. And he spent those next couple of years going around the country, going on every radio show he could, visiting people up close and personal, and making the case to them. And I saw a great deal of analogy there. I see somebody who's an outsider to the system. President Reagan got to D.C., Donald Trump was going to get to D.C., honestly, oh, and nobody, nothing. It's very unique, not having been a senator, not having been a member of Congress. And President Trump was an unconventional candidate looking for an unconventional team. And I wasn't, I was already on the campaign. I, always had a, I already had a good relationship with Donald Trump, the businessman. I sat on the condo board of the Trump World Tower for many years from 2006 to 2014. So I had encountered him because I'd show up for the condo board meetings, you know, a little bit organized, tabbing my binder. Mm -hmm. By the way, not tabbing the binder like they do at the podium now in the White House restroom <laughs> because I speak with no notes, no nets. Give it a try sometime, Kamala. <laughs> um, <laughs> never fighting with a teleprompter here. <clears throat> you can invite her for a debate here, I'll come. Uh -uh. <laughs> all right. We'll, we'll all come. Yeah, you're on, you're on. She does spend a lot of time in California, and she doesn't, her public schedule doesn't seem very full on the weekend, so I'm available. <laughs> uh, anyhow, back to this. So I had my binder, I went to show up at the Trump World Tower board meetings, and I'm ready to go, and all of a sudden, the first time I went, I heard this booming voice, it sounded like Donald J. Trump, and I said, there's no way he comes to the condo board meetings. Yes, he does. They told me he comes to all of them, all 17 buildings in, in New York at the time. He didn't have any notes. He, he knew every single thing was going on in the building. And that's the person I encountered in the campaign. That's the person I encountered every day behind the Resolute desk. But I think he wanted something different, but he also appreciated that he got to know me through the TV and then through briefing him. And he said, you know, you're very tough. You're very smart. You're very tough. You don't back down. He said, but you also admit when it's not a good day for the home team, as I always like to say. Like, yeah, today was a rough day for the home team. Maybe tomorrow will be better. <laughs> Here's what happened. You never hear that now. It's everything's fine. Inflation <laughs> is under control. The border's secure. <laughs> it's not raining when it is. And so <laughs> that is not rain, you see. <laughs> and so, um, but when President, when Mr. Trump asked me to be campaign manager, I was already one of the five pollsters on his team. And I was a senior advisor um, to his campaign at the time. But he said to me, 
he asked to just see me, he cleared the room, and it was just the two of us, and I write about it in the book, and I'll go through it quickly, because I think it's directional for the future. I think what I said to him six years ago is still true, and we need to do it again, and it wasn't done in 2020, frankly. He said, uh, we're gonna win this thing, right? And I said, you're gonna win this thing. I'm on TV saying it, and I'm saying how. I said, but you know, you're behind in the polls, because he said, oh, the polls. I said, you know, Mr. Trump, I don't know a billion things about a billion things. I couldn't build these skyscrapers. I couldn't have a number one show on NBC like you did. But I do know voters and I do know consumers. And right now, Hillary's winning a little bit because nobody even thinks about her. Nobody talks about her. And not just at home, uh, where she wakes up every morning as the second most popular person in a two-person household. That has to hurt. <laughs> But really, I said to Mr. I said, Mr. Trump, can we make this election more about Hillary Clinton? Because right now the election is just about you. And he said, I know, I get the best press coverage. And I said, well, you certainly get the most press coverage. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh. And I said, if you can make this election even just a little bit more about Hillary Clinton, whom the polls all say is not seen as trustworthy or honest or likable. It's Barack Obama who said that. So we'll take his word for it. Hmm. Likeable enough. Okay. Now, what was, what was America going to say, John, if they said, I don't think Hillary is trustworthy or likable or honest, but, but what? But you want her to have the nuclear codes? You want her to be commander in chief? You want her to be president? But I want to vote for the first woman. So do I, but just not that one. And <laughs> I said to him, if you, and I give Mr. Trump a ton of credit because he's absolutely right. Part of his magic was all the free press coverage he got, and then by extension, the rest of us got. And boy, did the, the people who gave us the free coverage not like that very much. More on them in a second, because it's part of the story. But I said to him, if you can, he said, okay, make it a little bit more about her. Now, that was great, because I said to him, you know, the female candidates that I've witnessed, Democrat and Republican over time, down ballot, they often have three big advantages, and Hillary has none of them. He said, what are they? I said, female candidates are often seen as fresh and new. Joni Ernst ran in 2014 in Iowa, cleared the primary field. Iowa had never sent a woman to Washington from either party. I said, women are, are often seen as, hey, we've never had a, a woman here. Hey, you should, that's fresh and new. Fresh idea is great. Secondly, we're seen, for better or worse, as less corruptible. You've never heard the phrase, the old girls club, because there isn't one. <laughs> And so often, and believe me, I grew up in politics in New Jersey, so often when somebody has been indicted or imprisoned, um, they'll say, we need a woman, we need a woman. And they get women to run, we're seen as you know, beyond reproach, more ethical in the main. Third, and nobody saw Hillary that way, fresh and new, beyond reproach, ethical. Third thing was women are seen often, John, as great consensus builders, natural, naturally good negotiators, genuinely interested in what the other party, the other side has to say and wanting to work together. Nobody saw her that way. That was not the way she presented herself. And then I said to the president, look, I'll do this if you're serious and candid camera is not in that plant over there <laughs> on the 26th floor of, of the Trump Tower. And I said, I'll do this, Mr. Trump, but I need three things in return. He said, okay, what are they? And I asked for three things and he granted them all. And I said, well, who do I have to talk to about this? He said, what do you mean? And I said, well, who do I ask to get that approved? And he looked around, he looked out the window and he said, honey, you just, I just told you, let's do that. I just, me. And I said, because I had given some version of the pitch to the Romney people, to the McCain people, to other people. I'd given some version of the pitch. And here was part of the pitch. And I, it's my pitch today to all of you. Don't be seduced into this trap of electability. I'm hearing it again this cycle. Electability is a fiction. Electability pretends I know if you will or won't win. And electoral college is how you do or don't win. That's exactly what I said to him in those words. And anybody who's sitting there right now saying, that is so genius, you're wrong. It's not genius. I'll let you know when I'm being a genius. <laughs> I'm not being a genius. <laughs> it's pretty basic stuff. You win not by people saying you will win, but by doing the work to actually win by focusing. He said, okay, I like that. I said, you've already beaten 17 qualified Republican men and women to become the nominee. You've blown electability to smithereens. Everybody, nobody took you seriously and you won. You did it. The people followed you. And just as I will respectfully tell you, donors don't choose presidents. The media don't choose presidents. The fiction of electability doesn't choose presidents. Pundits don't choose presidents. The voters choose their presidents.
Absolutely. And so he said, he said, go on. And I thought, wow, I've got the floor. I'll keep going. And I said, well, Mr. Mm. Mr. Trump, the way that we tackle elected, the Electoral College then is to bust through the, the states, the 11 or 12 states that, and this is key again, Obama, Biden carried twice with over 50% of the vote, where Hillary has not been above 50 and stayed there in anybody's credible polling. And most important factor, where a state that has elected a Republican governor and or senator statewide during the Obama-Biden years. So they're not allergic to Republicans. In fact, when they needed to choose a chief executive or balance out the Senate or congressional delegation, they voted Republican. That opened up a big aperture of possibilities. Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina, Florida, Iowa, Michigan, even states we didn't win in the end. Colorado, um, New Hampshire. It also opened up Arizona, excuse me, not Arizona, Nevada. And so we talked about that. And he said, okay. And I said, okay, that's it. He said, yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds good. Let's do that. I mean, I think that Donald Trump wanted someone different who didn't feel afraid to actually try something new. And let me tell you something. When you are underestimated, when you are under dog, when you were understaffed, under-resourced, as the Trump campaign was, you just have to pull the boss's swagger, hunger, connective tissue, joy on the job, and figure it out. And uh, he also allowed us to look at polling a little bit more granularly. Everybody asks the same polling questions. They're not biased at all, the polling questions. They're worse than biased or useless. Because biased questions at least are easy to see or easy to hear. The useless questions are very difficult to understand, to detect. And yet, if I don't ask you to tell me anything in the polling question, you're, not, you're bound to not tell me anything rich and new and enlightening and actionable. So he allowed us to do that. And it really just opened up a whole new group of possible voters. And then finally, I, I coined the term in July of 2016, right before I became campaign manager, um, to international ridicule and derision. I coined the term the undercover hidden Trump voter. And people laughed and they said, ha, oh, today Kellyanne Conway said the hidden Trump voter who we're pretty sure will still be hidden on election day. Mm -hmm. So why do I tell you that? Well, I tell you that because it's very real. And I see it again in 2022 and you can easily see it in 2024. It's basic, it's very simple. Again, not genius, very simple. These are people, they're not embarrassed to say they're gonna vote Republican or vote for Trump. They just don't want every night to feel like Thanksgiving with the in-laws. They're tired of arguing with everybody about it. That's why your vote is private. And that's why so many people, all the people in the media practically didn't see him coming, but that's why so many people who didn't look like Trump voters voted for President Trump, because what is that? That's a very biased thing to say about people. People have a right to vote for whomever they want. This is the greatest democracy on the earth. You have a right to vote. You have a right to not vote if you choose not to. You don't have a right to vote more than once, but you do have a right mm -hmm. to vote, mm -hmm. or if you're dead, uh, you do have a right to vote for whom you want. And that's what happened. And it happened for him in 2020 in terms of the president really expanding the map in many ways. But I think in 2020, I write about it in my book, I call it a tale of two campaigns. I think for $1.4 billion and running on that great record of accomplishment, not really adapting to COVID as a campaign, as a, as a reality, as the number one issue to many Americans. Um, and running it, but $1.4 billion running against Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, it should have been able to get the job done, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly and outright. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have so many questions I'd like to You're paying to ask me by you. the word tonight, yeah, right? I know. Excellent. I, I wish, I really wish we had five hours. We don't, and in just a moment, I'm gonna turn it to the audience oh, for wonderful. you to ask questions. I have one last question, and I'll jump right to it, and I know it's the question you've been asked five million times, and that is, do you think that Donald Trump will run again in 2024? The answer is. I know as fact he'd like to, and he is planning to, yes. I, th I think, I think someone um, very close to me said it best recently. She said, 
well, the country needs him, but does he really need to do that for him? People who care about him, as I do, uh, worry. He doesn't need my worry, but I just worry about people I care about and the way they're treated. And in fact, in the case of President Trump, um, he's got a great life. He has a wonderful family, all the different political motivators that apply to people in politics, including if not especially at the presidential level, did not apply to him. Money, fame, power, fortune, bankability, later on, you know. And so he had all of that, and he gave that up. He gave up much of it uh, to be president. But he'd like to run, and the main reason President Trump would like to run is Number, well, two main reasons. Number one, because he feels there's a lot of unfinished business. He had planned to have another term. So that was, um, the planning for that was underway. The policy prescriptions within that term were underway. And secondly, he is like so many millions of Americans right now, John, who are absolutely devastated over what's happened to this country in such a short amount of time. You know, in less time than it takes to have a baby, the people in charge really ruined so many of the great accomplishments. They really did, and I can't understand why. It certainly can't be ideology only, because you don't kill the Keystone Pipeline on day one, and the 42,000 possible jobs that go within the energy independence we were already enjoying, and now have people in focus groups, our focus group white knuckled saying, I'm worried about my heating bills come this fall and winter. I'm worried about not just gas and groceries anymore, ladies and gentlemen, insurance, utilities, rent, mortgage. One of the fastest growing new groups of homeless in our country are single moms who have a job. They have a job. They're trying the best they can to support themselves and their children. But the job is not enough. So I know President Trump wants to get back in there and help the job creators, the job seekers, and the vast majority of American households the job holders. We're hearing from people right now, hey, we have two, three jobs in our household. We're not worried about losing our job. We're not worried about replacing a lost job. We're worried, in fact, we're scared to death that there's not a thing we can do to change the fact that having the job doesn't seem to be enough to pay the bills. That's new. And there's a reason for that. It's not coincidence. Mm -hmm. It's causation. So when, when, when President Trump and the rest of us see that, so many in the country, obviously, if you look at the polls, oh, the President Biden's doing better. Where? In Wilmington? Because I think he actually ran for mayor of Wilmington, as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, they just put him in the Oval. But he, seriously speaking, his poll numbers had nowhere to go but up, but they're not that much better. He's still underwater on all the major issues. And I think more importantly and more startlingly and probably tells you the tale of Joe Biden's inability to recover from his poor ratings vis-a-vis -vis the American public in the way that he needs to, to for Democrat candidates to want to run with him in 2022, which very few, if any, do, they don't, um, and for him to win again in 2024, win in 2024. It's the following. I've never seen a president's personal attributes crater so quickly especially a Democratic president. So even when President Obama or President Bill Clinton, the only President Clinton will ever have, um, even, when their, <laughs> even when their numbers, when they were having tough times with their approval ratings or the economy or something abroad, their personal attributes were still fairly robust. So those personal attributes are has compassion, has a plan for the country, has vision, cares about people like me, is good for the middle class, has the energy to do the job, all of those personal attributes went badly quickly for President Biden. And so President Trump wants to, he wanted to announce already, my own advice was um, that I've said to him, that I'll say to you is just, I think you should wait till after the midterms. Even if you wanted to say right now, I have a big announcement that I'm going to tell you on November 9th. Everybody would say, okay, I've, I'm announcing today, I have a big announcement on November 9th. Everybody will be there and they will pay attention to it. But otherwise, he'll be blamed for any of the midterm losses <laughs> by those never Trump consultants who begged Trump for the endorsement and got it. They'll, they'll, he'll be blamed for the losses. And I think people are very focused on other things. And the, and the other thing is, let people really nest in and get used to the Biden-Harris presidency. 
and all of its failings and flailings. And while we're on the topic, let me say this to you. The other reason President Trump would like to run again is because so many people ask him to, including people who did not vote for him. They do. He gets mm -hmm. letters all of the time. People say to him, you know, I didn't like the tweets, or I didn't vote for you, or I voted for you, I didn't, I, did, I forgot to vote, I didn't vote, I was worried about COVID. Whatever it is they say, please can you do that again, because this is America, and we are resilient, and we are hopeful, and we are hardy, and we are, yes, <laughs> and we are, <clears throat> and we, we, you, we have overcome over centuries. We've overcome far greater challenges than Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But that's not even what Americans are saying right now. They're not even saying it will get better. I hope it will get better. I know it will get better. They're saying, John, it was so much better not that long ago. How do we get back there? That's a different issue set. That's a different consideration. And you know, when people look at the polls, and 99% of the polls you see are media or academic polls, and they're notoriously wrong. After 2016, the Democratic pollster said, oopsies. They literally apologized and said, we really undercounted the Trump voter, and we really underestimated Donald Trump's strength. Wow, how did that happen? And they made one adjustment. They made one major adjustment to education levels. You know what? We should include more people in our sample who didn't go to college. Well, yes, you should, because it's half the country, and or thereabouts. Um, and so they did that. And then after 2020, they said, oopsie, we got it wrong again. We undercounted the Trump voter. We underestimated Trump's strength. And they have polls that say Joe Biden's winning Wisconsin by 17 points right before the election. No, he wasn't. Neither was Trump. That's why it's Wisconsin. It's a swing state. That poll shouldn't even be released. And they, they use polls to manipulate and create public opinion, not to reflect it. So we will not be bamboozled and seduced into that. But I say it to you for a simple reason. All the polls aside, remember this. Your vote is private. You may be hidden. You may not want to argue with anybody anymore. Or worse, risk losing a seat in the college you want to attend or your child wants to attend. Risk losing your job by speaking out. Risk losing more friendships. Risk losing not being invited to the mommy play group or the senior center for something. But here's what you want to remember. This, in this country, we protest and we pontificate in groups, but we vote as individuals. And people will go into that ballot box or they will seal that envelope and they will vote according to their own self-interest. Why wouldn't we? That is, why, that is why we vote. And the issue set is so uncomplicated. Why are people making it so? I've never seen an issue set so uncomplicated. Rising cost, rising crime, a lack of security in your communities on your streets, at the border, in Ukraine. Vis-a-vis -vis are standing in the world in a, a nuclear-capable Iran staring at our best friend Israel. A lack of affordability. Everyday life is becoming increasingly unaffordable. A lack of fairness. People say it's not fair that you're making me pay for someone else's student loans. That's not fair. They say it's not fair. And the final issue. I call it the SAFE acronym. S is security, A is affordability, so you can remember F is fairness slash foreign policy, and E is education, Y. For the first time since I've been doing this in 34 years, I'm sure Governor Wilson and Mrs. Wilson will know, for the first time, Republicans and Democrats are seen as equal, almost tied on the issue of which party do you trust more to handle education? What are we doing to our kids? I was in Orange County last week, and uh, I was there when Gavin Newsom sent his alert for everybody to turn off their air conditioning at 4 p.m. <laughs> he's not even worth discussing. Please, yeah, he's not worth discussing, but. But I'll say this to you. What are we doing to our kids that last week some of the schools in our major cities closed or closed early because there wasn't air conditioning? We spent billions of dollars on ventilation, on the stickers on the ground, six feet apart, on masks, on teachers. On, what are we doing on making sure teachers felt comfortable to go back to the classroom is what I mean to say. But I'll tell you this, education is a sleeper issue and it is nested in every single election in this country. Terry McAuliffe last year in Virginia already tried the playbook. He tried to run on Trump and abortion. Trump, 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 Trump abortion, abortion, abortion. He already tried that. 
He said Trump and abortion, and Glenn Youngkin said Virginia and education, with President Trump's endorsement and help. But he said it. Why do I say this? Because you're on the right side of the education issue. 60 years after bigoted Democrat governors in the South stood in the schoolhouse door and prevented kids of color from going into the schools, we have bigoted Democrats all across this country standing in the schoolhouse door, preventing kids of all backgrounds from coming out of those failing schools and going and accessing an education that is quality, affordable, and worthy of each and every child's humanity and dignity. And ladies and gentlemen, every single child deserves a basic education. It is, we owe it to each of them. And we're spending all this money and not letting it follow the child. There's one political party that is standing in the way of that. And you're on the right side of this issue. Screen time is school time, driving three million women, including me, out of the workforce because the kids are going to be online again for the second school year. And don't lose the moment. Don't just talk about masking six-year-olds and CRT. Don't lose the moment to talk about charter schools and school choice and educational freedom and opportunity scholarships. Mm. Oh, You're on the right side of that issue. Mm. Good. Good. We have time for just a couple questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we will bring a microphone to you. We'll come right over here for starters. Yeah, she's going to hand you a mic. There you are. First of all, I just want to, you're my hero. I want to I love thank you, too. You for, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart and for my family for lending your energy and intelligence and grace to lifting this nation. I thank you. You know, here in California, we wake up and horses that we have saved from the meat market are suddenly going to be banned from the Santa Monica Mountains. Who made that law? Nobody. We never get to vote on anything. They take away our ability to leave our homes to our children without the death taxes on. And I'm asking you, please, when you go out into the world, tell them what's happening here in California with a one-party system. Tell them to be careful of the Californians who have come to their neighborhoods. And tell them, please, don't let it happen to our country. Awesome. Thank you, Thank Kellyanne. You. Thank you. Love you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Over here. Hi. Hi. Pleasure meeting you. Um, as a Republican, I feel, I guess the word is uncertain, scared about what's going to happen in the next election. Um, I feel like it's unfair, and we want to scream at the rooftops as Republicans, but we don't. We're, we're quiet, and I, I don't feel like 2020 was completely fair. I don't want to say it was rigged. Um, I don't want to use those words because I'm actually Canadian, but I'm now an American citizen, and I'm very proud <laughs> to be a wonderful an American citizen. Um, you have hopes for 2024, and as a Republican, you, you give us hope, but how are we ensuring that things are going to be done right? Who watches over all this voting and to ensure that we are getting a fair deal? Whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, I just feel like 2020 was just, I don't know, like, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to. Thank you so much. I, I mean, I do hear that often. I think people do talk about that. They, if they don't use the words fraud, theft, stolen, they feel like something wasn't fair, they'll never know. It was just a weird election. Uh, more people voting in more ways over more time than ever before. Just longer periods of time for you to vote. And I like to say that we have to make it easier to vote, harder to, to cheat. And that should not be controversial or partisan to anyone. The one person, one vote guarantee enshrined in the Constitution to each and every one of us is one of the most sacrosanct rights that each of us has and one of the, one of the most important duties that our government, as our steward, 
should ensure is protected because it is the most equalizing factor for all. It really is the most equalizing factor. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, where you're going, you get one vote and so does everyone else. But I'd like to, so yes, I think that um, some of the COVID compelled measures for a once in a century pandemic should not have been codified and made permanent. And they have been in many states. I think you're looking in one, you're sitting in one. And if, you know, if this is a once in a century pandemic that compelled a different way of voting last time, then talk to me in 98 years and we'll try all over again. Um, also, I don't, think that, I don't think that we're communicating to the public that voting is an important exercise, a sacrosanct constitutionally guaranteed franchise exercise if we allow you two months to do it. So North Carolina, they're already voting early. Not absentee, not, but they're voting early. I think if you say to people, you have this amount of time to vote, like election day, um, we don't need election trimester, election period, <laughs> election month. There's nothing in your life that you have two months to do. Mm. Really, like that. So that would help. There should be no ballot harvesting. Chain of custody should be an election official or a US Postal Service worker anyway. People should not be able to knock on your door and tell you I'll take that ballot for you. Did you need another one or do you, you know, you can hand it out. And by the way, we should have bipartisan election watchers. We spend so many billions of dollars on our elections in the states and federally, but most of this is at the state level, I'm sure you know that, that we should be able to have bipartisan folks who are approved to watch. That will, you know why? It's not that we're, we're saying there's presumptive um, guilt on the other side. It's that we're giving confidence to the people that you feel more secure. But let me say it substantively to you for a moment. Leader McCarthy is about to put out the commitment to America. He's had seven working groups with the members of Congress. Newt Gingrich and I are helping with that next week with the members the day before they go to unveil it. And it's big. It's everything you believe in. A safe America, kids with, in every neighborhood have opportunity, an economy that works for everyone, so on and so forth. And I'm saying this to you because substantively, you should feel very good about the bright line distinction between the two political parties. I've never seen such a bright line distinction. And it's not the Democratic Party I grew up in. I, can't, I don't even recognize it. You're on the side of freedom. Everyone here is on the side of economic freedom. You're on the side of energy independence. You're on the side of national security. You're on the side of prosecuting criminals and not making everyday people feel like criminals because they have a different point of view than everybody else at the table. And, and by the way, I see, I hear a little bit of hesitation in your voice, if I may, about who you are and what you believe. I gotta tell you, we need you to stand up, speak up, and show up, and put up more and more, not less and less, because let me tell each and every one of you, I know it's not fun to be called names, and you're a racist, you're a sexist, you're a xenophobe. You know you're not. They call you names because they don't want you to have a name. They don't want to know your name. They want to give you a name, and it's really just a label. You stand up and you say your name, and for you, ma'am, you go tell everybody, I'm a, I'm a new American citizen, I'm a Republican, I, here's my seven second reason, my 70 second reason, and my seven minute reason. Why I show up, speak up, put up, stand up, why I'm a Republican, why I'm a conservative, why I believe this. And you get more people along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, that, that, that was, um really well put, but also we are really out of time. Oh. I am so Seriously? sorry. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I... Is there Kelly, any way we pay the DJ to stay the other yeah. way? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kellyanne, there is just incredible admiration for you, and I, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Please remain seated as our...